Hello and welcome to Step by Step, a podcast by Future Commerce presented by OmniSend. This is season four of Step by Step and you are listening to episode four of four. So if you're just joining us at the very end, I suggest you should go back and listen from the very beginning because Step by Step is best enjoyed contiguously. You should enjoy it start to finish. Go back and listen from the very beginning. Hey, you know, it is tough right now. It's tough for all of us. It is tough in direct-to-consumer. How do you compete with the bigger brands? They can outspend you from Monday to Friday. They can run circles around you in every single channel. Is it is it even possible to stand toe-to-toe with big global and national brands? It is. And you can do that with automation. You can be in every channel and you can convert in every channel and activate customers in every channel and make them into loyal customers that are evangelists of your brand. We're going to teach you how. If you are an independent retailer, if you're a startup in e-commerce, if you're in direct-to-consumer, or even if you've built a bootstrapped e-commerce business and you have no intent to exit that business, this series is for you. This is part four of four. And we're sitting down with founders of small and medium-sized e-commerce startups to help you craft the ultimate multi-channel customer journey. You're going to leverage automation and you're going to take that marketing of yours to the next level. We're going to teach you how. We're going to take you from zero to hero, step by step. Joining us today on the show is Kaylin Marcotte. Kaylin is the founder of Jiggy, a beautiful, artful, and incredibly intentional e-commerce brand that is making jigsaw puzzles into high art. We're going to ask the question, what tools can a small brand use to automate customer engagement? And Kaylin is going to take us from zero to hero, step by step. Let's join Kaylin for an amazing interview. We are continuing our series here, the step-by-step mini-series, and we are so glad to be joined today with uh, the founder and CEO at Jiggy. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say we're going to get Jiggy with it. Um, <laughs> showing my age here. Uh, Kaylin Marcotte, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And this is uh, this is special for me. Um, I've spent a disproportionate amount of time doing puzzles in this year, <laughs> 2020. So I've, I've kind of blown it. What is Jiggy? <laughs> Jiggy, we are a jigsaw puzzle company partnering with emerging female artists from around the world. We curate their work and turn it into puzzles. Wow. So uh, cool. What a year to have a puzzle business. <laughs> Yeah, you're telling me. I know people are like, "Did you have a crystal ball or something?" We launched yeah. last November, so four months no pre-COVID. <laughs> that's uh, that's really great, and we're we're glad to have you on. You know, we we this particular series is uh, brought to us uh, in partnership with OmniSend. We know you are a customer of OmniSend. In fact, mm-hmm. you've been on OmniSend's podcast with uh, Greg Zakowitz. Yeah, and. Um, so I, I think one of the things we'll want to dive into today is, you know, like how how you are thinking about marketing and, uh, you know, you're, you're brand new. Your business isn't yeah. even a year old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and now you're a thought leader. Um, and so let's, I, I thought we would kind of start at the top before we get into any of that stuff. What's, what's the story and what prompted you to start Jiggy? Yeah. So my background is more on the media marketing side of things. This is my first physical product uh, company and first time being a founder myself. I was the first employee at the Skim. So I, I majored in political science in college. I was doing management consulting. Then I met the co-founders of the Skim. They were doing a seed round of funding and had launched the newsletter a year prior. And, um, I was just really interested in, in what they were doing and how millennials were connecting with current events and just thought, I want to be a part of this. So I jumped on board, uh, 2013 and ended up being there for four years. I was responsible for basically our community marketing. So our brand ambassador program, social email events, uh, and in that time, which was an incredible experience, but also all consuming and very stressful and lived Uh. and breathed on my phone and computer. I was looking for a way to just unwind and get away from screens and 
you know, it was like 2015 headspace. Everyone was talking about meditation, this kind of first self-care wellness. Uh, I was really entering the zeitgeist and I tried meditating. It didn't quite land. Um, tried a couple other, you know, DIY things. And then somewhat randomly had a puzzle in my apartment. I had done them as a kid, but, but not in 15 years and did it. And it just clicked. And I found it really relaxing and stress relieving. I was a chronic multitasker and there was no way to multitask and, and focus on the pieces at the same time. So it really got me away from everything else. So I fell in love with puzzles again in yeah 2015 and then was doing basically a thousand piece puzzle every single week and always stopping at the toy store in the West Village around my apartment and looking for new ones online. And all the ones I could find were just really outdated and cheesy and the stock photography of right. know, watercolor scenes and landscapes and puppies and butterflies. <laughs> and it's just like, I'm spending... 15 hours, like staring at every detail of this image. Why can't I actually enjoy it? And then once it's done, I have this, you know, 20 inch print. What if it was actually something I wanted to keep? So the idea sparked then the seedling for Jiggy, uh, that was back. Yeah. 2015. And I ended up being with the skin through 2017. Um, and it just kept developing. I couldn't, I kept coming back to it. And, and so ultimately decided uh, to really start working on it. And we launched last year. Wow. wow. What a story. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what an interesting way to find sort of your, your jam. Like you tried everything, everything to, to sort of disconnect and unplug mm -hmm. something that we've talked a lot about on the show. And, um, and then, you know, puzzles are what sort of allows you to have that singular focus. Mm -hmm. um, and as, talk a little bit about the connection with female artists and, and how you, you know, you decided to, to go that route and, um, and, and nonprofits. And I mean, you've got some really cool artwork on yeah. the site. Uh, how did the, those partnerships come about? Yes. When I had the idea, originally I started an, a folder in my phone, just in the iPhotos of literally just called puzzle art. And anytime I was on Instagram or a gallery or show in New York, uh, I just kept my eyes open for art. Cause you know, it, it, I did take the lens of what would look good completed, but also there has to be enough color and detail and differentiation for it actually to be fun to do as a puzzle. So I uh, started, you know, looking for art that I thought would be both and screenshotting it and, and keeping it in this folder. And then when I really started working on Jiggy, I went back through it. I reached out to the artists and um, at the time it was just anything I saw, you know, male, female, New York, around the country. Uh, and then I, I really decided that I wanted to focus on female artists for a couple of reasons. One, I, I went to an all women's college. I went to Barnard College in New York and I had mm. many friends who pursued that path. And I just saw how hard it was to actually monetize your work as talented as you were, you know, kind of the, the paths to really support yourself and make a living were just so limited and difficult. And there were all these gatekeepers. And so that was one reason. And then I also went to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston uh, around this time. And there was an exhibit on female artists and in big block letters on the wall, they had written, um, can you name five female artists? And, you know, I was with a whole group, wow. very like educated people. And we were like, Oh, of course, of course. And then, you know, you kind of stood there and was like, okay, like Frida, and, um, like George O'Keefe, um, you know, <laughs> and, uh, so it just really, I think made clear that, that there's so much talent, uh, that still is, you know, waiting to, to have a platform and be discovered. Mm. So I wanted to focus there and structured it so that they receive a percentage of every sale. Um, so a couple of reasons. One, that goes into some of the marketing we'll talk about. Wanted to incentivize them to help, you know, be on yep. our marketing team. Um, and make sure that, you know, they were really getting getting a piece of the growth. Um, so focused on that and launched our first collection 
last November with six designs. So six different female artists from around the world, different backgrounds. And yeah, that was our debut collection. Yeah. Uh, well, that's... Uh... What a story. I, I think that there's, you, you see, in a world full of sort of the stock imagery and maybe Thomas Kincaid, uh, <laughs> pastoral uh, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, puzzles, it, you're creating, and, and by the way, what's really, really interesting about this is that it just touches on so many things that don't have to be platitudes. Like instead of mm-hmm. it, it screaming at the consumer, behave this way, it's actually just a product that requires you to engage with it in a way that like actually alters your behavior. Mm-hmm. And so instead of having to, you know, center a business around, you know, around trying to change people's, uh, uh, change people's behavior, you, you're actually right. creating uh, not only something tactile, but something like v- visually really Im- it, 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 sort of important. It has just, there's so many layers here. Uh, I'm struck by on, on, you know, just in the product photography, uh, I'm struck by the fact that there's glue that's included. I have this amazing yeah. memory of my... Uh, my grandmother who would put together these very large puzzles and Mm -hmm. then, you know, glue it together and hang it up. And, and, uh, which, you know, is just a, it's a memory I have. And to see that sort of come back and this idea of something that, you know, puzzles are kind of ephemeral and impermanent and you interact with them once you've made it into a piece that, uh, you know, maybe sticks around for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's been a really, rewarding for us to see, you know, that it actually is something that ends up in people's homes. And it's this kind of memento, especially the last six months, you know, people doing puzzles in, in quarantine and kind of this just reminder of, of recentering. Mm. Um, and for our artists, I mean, it's such a, an interesting relationship that builds between, the the puzzler and the artist, like they're seeing every detail of their work. You know, there's such, it's an interactive relationship. And I think there's a lot more appreciation for the artwork having literally reconstructed it and, you know, studied, studied every inch of it. Um, So I was, I was hopeful that people would, the glue would resonate and people would actually use it for me. And I was doing all these puzzles, even the ones I didn't like, I was just too sentimental to tear apart right away. There was something just deeply unsatisfying about the last piece going in and then, okay, like what now? Yeah. And so I wanted to kind of unlock that, that second experience, um, and really, and really create, uh, a more, a more well-rounded experience in it. And so I had the idea for the glue. I knew it was out there. Um, but, but really I was trying to figure out what to apply it with. And I, you know, was picturing maybe like a, a little paintbrush, um, but it ended up leaving like brush strokes, you know, like marks. And so I was like, okay, that's not it. Maybe like a mini paint roller that was more like felt Mm. and that didn't really work. And then I was on this puzzle community on Reddit and this guy (laughs) named Randy somewhere in the Midwest, uh, posted a link to a YouTube video of him just dumping glue onto a puzzle and using his credit card. And I was like, Oh, that's all like, you just need a straight edge surface, um, wow. that would just help spread it and gets it super clean. Um, so yeah, developed our, our kind of gold straight edge tool that comes with every order as well from that. Wow. That's uh, just like the level of detail is so, so pretty. It's so beautiful that I think um, you put a lot into like the whole packaging experience, actually, the way mm-hmm. that the puzzle comes is in the, like a glass jar, which mm-hmm. is really cool. And um, the, the the puzzle itself is closer to a canvas, correct, than it is like traditional, like flimsy puzzle material. Talk to us a little bit about yeah. um, why that's important. Yeah. So the puzzle itself is you know, just really nice, extra thick cardstock. It's printed double-sided. So for that, I mean, I, it helps that I was a puzzle fanatic doing them all the time and had all of these ideas of how I would make it better and then was actually able to. But one was that drove me crazy was the puzzle dust. Like you open this bag and you Mm -hmm. dump out the pieces and there's just like dust everywhere. 
And so our, we have kind of a two-step process, you know, the, the, the pieces are die cut. And then as they're taken apart, some of the dust, uh, releases. And then when it's actually packaged into the glass, the second time that gets them out and, uh, in the manufacturing, we print on both sides. So the back side is actually not exposed, um, cardstock. So that helps. And, uh, it makes it extra thick as well. We have kind of a satiny matte finish, um, that just feels nicer when you're handling these pieces for hours and hours and then creates kind of a more, a more luxe finish when it's complete to frame it. Um, so yes, I was, I was very precious with every, every component and probably took longer than I needed because of it, but I hope ultimately it shows now. How do you take your your passion for something that's, you know, effectively a, you know, a pastime or something mm-hmm. that, you know, you know, is, is this meditative tactile thing that you use to, you know, to to entertain yourself? How do you turn that into a business? I mean, that's, <laughs> it's one thing to make a product. It's another thing. You know, some people just say, oh, I wonder how these are made. And they watch a YouTube video. Other people <laughs> like yourself aren't content unless they actually like find a way to <laughs> and to make a living out of it. Um, have you found a way to turn it into, you know, uh, from from just products into like an actual business that you actually then have to like, you know, run? Right, right. Yes, imagine that. <laughs> um, I I have, and I remind myself daily that it is such a privilege to be able to do so. Um, mm. Yeah, you know, I it started definitely as just kind of, hmm, like, how is the, how are these made? If I could make them better, how would I? And, you know, really just loose brainstorming. And then, you know, again, I started doing them in 2015. I didn't launch the company until 2019. So there were years in there where I was kind of just watching different trends and the wellness category and, and this appetite for analog, you know, I saw the adult coloring books and other kind of DIY, uh, stuff and just this digital detox, like a lot of these conversations, Mm -hmm. I, you know, encouraged me as like, Oh, like puzzles are my version of that. You know, there seems to be a business there and an appetite for, for these products. So, um, is there something, is there actually a business to be made, not just Kaylin's better puzzle that she wants to make for herself? So yeah, that gave me more and more confidence. And then ultimately, I think I now feel so driven by our mission, which we have two, we have these two communities that we're building with the brand. One is our, you know, customer community and people who are, actual puzzle fans already or never done a puzzle in 15 years either. We actually did a customer survey recently, which is interesting. And it was, it was about half of our customers had never bought a jigsaw puzzle before Jiggy. So, you know, we really are reaching, um, this new, this new audience who's curious and, and interested, but, you know, puzzles weren't a part of their lives before or just art fans and they want to support, female artists and think it's cool to kind of have a hand in, in constructing it and putting it together. So we're definitely focusing a lot on, on relationship building and community building there. And then the other side is this artist community and, um, you know, putting together now it started just me, um, finding them on Instagram, going to these fairs. Now that we've launched and have some more visibility, we get a lot of inbound, we have an open submission process. Um, and one, kind of example that I think shows not only that we've been able to actually build a brand and business around it, but how we're kind of activating this community is our originals campaign we did during COVID. So basically what happened there is, you know, quarantine, everyone's stuck at home looking for activities, puzzle boom, we sell out of our uh, normal product. And at the same time, this community of artists who I'm emailing with daily, um, saying, you know, galleries are closed, exhibits are canceled. We don't have a ton of ways to support ourselves. Like this is really, this is really tough spot. So I had the idea to get blank white puzzles made while our normal product, you know, was, was in production, but taking a long time. And I knew we were going to be sold out. So inventory issues, but what, I was able to get fairly quickly kind of off the shelf or blank white puzzles. The pieces are pre-cut and no image is printed on them. 
So I hmm. received those, started shipping them out to our artists. And my only kind of directive was create art on this canvas um, wow. that, that was a puzzle. So they hand painted, hand drew, just blew me away and created, you know, these truly one of a kind original pieces of art on blank puzzles. And then we hosted a auction. So we hosted an original art puzzle auction um, in May and split the proceeds between the artist herself and then COVID relief fundraising. Um, so yeah, that was, that was definitely a highlight of, of this year thus far. Wow. It's so cool. I think it's so powerful. We talk a lot about leading with art uh, and how important it is, especially original art and, and sort of highlighting artists on the show. And that this is like, just like the sort of, um, the perfect example of what that means and how you can, um, I think lift people up with that. I think it's awesome. Uh, Thank let's, you. let's talk a little bit about your customers. Yeah. Uh, you said you, you had the artist side and then sort of the customer side, mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And you're curating two different communities. Um, Talk to, talk to us a little bit about how people are, you know, they're finding you and they're getting connected and they're getting engaged. Uh, what does that look like? Or in like really nasty business business terms, like <laughs> what's sort of your common customer purchasing journey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, it's been interesting, a couple different paths. So when we launched super organic, you know, went out to my network and, and asked everyone to share. We launched in November. So right before the holidays. So went into Q4 last year, uh, with just the goal of press around gift guides and, you know, holiday product roundups and all of that. So that definitely helps kind of jumpstart some of the just flywheel and word of mouth. we do a lot of gifting. And that's, I think, an interesting um, kind of growth tactic because essentially two, you know, two customers in one and people, the purchaser who now we have their email, the person who's gifted it, who usually follows up with us on social or tags us um, in, in their photos of doing the puzzle. So gifting has definitely been, been one way. The other is just that press in the beginning really focused on just product placements on these lists and roundups. And then going into this year, and especially with COVID and, you know, me being a one woman show and trying to pivot and dealing with supply chain and doing it all alone. And, you know, all that whole story, um, went after kind of the more business narrative, like founder feature press. Um, and then Mm. we did start, uh, Instagram ads. So I think the product is so visual. It's funny. I can't tell you how many times I've heard like, of course, like people see it and they're like, Oh, beautiful puzzles. Like, duh. You know, like this is so it's, it's so obvious or how many times we're like, Oh, like, why did I think of that? You know? And so I think, um, one, just the art itself, of course, being so visual, but also the product, the packaging, the glass jar, um, that is, you know, a new twist on it. So we want to show that and highlight that. So, you know, very visual product. Instagram is a great channel to, to communicate all of that. Um, so Instagram ads have been great, our organic Instagram content, um, and the features of our artists that we do has definitely started to help build that community. Um, and then what else? Email we have, you know, that's not really discovery out of the gate, but the biggest, again, this customer survey we did, the biggest buckets were, um, word of mouth, press and social media for, for kind of our first discovery. Future Commerce is brought to you by OmniSend. OmniSend is a powerful e-commerce tailored email and SMS marketing automation platform. It is built to give nimble teams the ability to drive more revenue without increasing their workload. That's right. You have a one-click e-commerce stack integration, pre-built workflows, and intuitive segmentation. And that makes it easy to get up and running without diving into the gritty details. That is unless you want to. It is a powerful platform for businesses of all sizes. Find out why Duke Cannon, Toac Chocolate, and 50,000 other high-growth e-commerce brands choose OmniSend 
to give them a shortcut to revenue growth and grow their business while putting it on autopilot. Find out today what OmniSend can do for you. Go to OmniSend.com slash future commerce. That's OmniSend.com slash future commerce. Put your marketing automation to work and connect with your customers in every channel with OmniSend. Visit them at OmniSend.com slash future commerce. You sort of mentioned being a one woman show. That's, mm-hmm. I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, Incredible. <laughs> and and <laughs> yeah. so I'm sure there's a lot of things that vie for your attention. To say that you're like the normal, you know, everyday person on the street who had a good idea, I think would be a bit of a, a stretch. Uh, you were employee number one at a company that you grew an audience to 6 million people. You're an exceptional person. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And 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 you were director of community, director of marketing at the skim. I I'm sure you understand like what, what it's like to do marketing and community at that scale. Mm-hmm. Where do you even begin? Like, where do you even start to say like, OK, I'm one person. I can only do so much. Uh, plus, I have to worry about supply chain and partnerships <laughs> and worry about like artist acquisition and, you know, talent management and mm-hmm. <laughs> manufacturing and. <laughs> delivery and probably fulfillment and uh, uh, all of those things, right? Um, Mm -hmm. So you only have so much time to focus on the things that I think were probably core competency in your other roles. Like what, Mm -hmm. where did you decide is like, what is, what are day one things um, from like a marketing stack perspective? And what are things that you feel like you'll have to kind of grow into over time um, as as sort of that solopreneur uh, role here in the early days of the business? Yeah. The the first couple things were, I think, things that were most familiar and tied most into those core competencies. So the storytelling, you know, out of the gate, just starting to, to hit, you know, real performance and CAC and being super data-driven, like that was not the case. Um, I really led with what I knew, which was our story, my story, our artists their stories. And so starting with a more, the more kind of narrative channels being email, um, set up, you know, on OmniSend made it easy to just set up a one time I went through and built the kind of welcome flow that I thought would lead with the product. You know, of course we want to convert sales there. So just show them our differentiators, but then tell that story and not taking for granted, which however you discovered us or came to us that you know what's behind the brand. So a welcome flow to tell that story, uh, you know, just the easy, low-hanging fruit, abandoned cart, things like that. Um, But then really focused on content and um, on social and trying to get people to amplify like through press. So the, the first kind of marketing stack, if you will, was really just Omnisend, uh, Instagram, and then very basic, you know, Jiggy, uh, was absolutely not in the first, whatever, 10 pages of search results for a while. So, um, just making sure that, that at least we were discoverable in search and now, now it's, we're up there. So, um, that's been okay, but yeah, that was kind of it. And, and really just focused on the organic side of things. And again, the artists were incentivized to help share. So they tapped their platforms and fans and followers, um, and have just kind of grown it from there. And now certainly looking into, you know, more of, of the paid performance side of things, as well as, kind of affiliate networks and not just the earned media, but some more of, right. um, yeah, the, the affiliate side of press too. That's a, such a modern strategy mm. to, uh, I, I, you know, be honest with you, it sounds very familiar because as a podcaster, like you want to try to <laughs> connect with people, uh, mm-hmm. who will also transplant their, their audience right into, mm-hmm. into ours or find, you know, some common ground of audience that, uh, we could all right. grow together. Um, and vice versa. So it's such an interest, like affiliate being the very next step. That sounds, that's, it just makes so much sense Mm -hmm. uh, from the way that you've, you've outlined it. Um, How much of your time is spent on, uh, like on, on different areas of the business right now in, you know, month 10 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what, like what, what does your day to day look like? And, you know, how much of it are you sort of relying on kind of like automations and things that just, mm-hmm. you know, you sort of set up and let it run? Yeah. The biggest buckets right now are, um, you know, the, the manufacturing and inventory cycle, you know, has its, um, its peaks and when it is, it's, it's pretty encompassing, but over the past few months, uh, we're, we're pretty set there. So gearing up for, Q4 and the holidays and some big partnerships and collaborations that we're doing. So day-to-day recently has looked like um, executing on those. So similar to the originals campaign we did for COVID, we're continuing to do kind of these limited edition, special edition collaborations around a certain cause or, or impact that we're passionate about. So talking to partners, um, curating which artists we want to work with for those, um, and then actually just executing on it. I'm um, just starting to to kind of do a team building exercise of what would my first few hires be? What does an org chart look like? Job descriptions, things like that. So that will, um, I think, be more of a focus over the next month and, and whether it's full-time or part-time, but really bringing on some help. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then... Yeah, inventory um, manufacturing. I have such a deep respect now for for operations and and really viewing. I think manufacturing is a partnership, which was a learning for me. That you know, beforehand, I just thought like you you have an idea, you want to get something made. There are these people out there who make things. That's what they do, and you just hire one and pay them. And it's been such. Uh, an iterative process and, you know, convincing them to to take a chance on me and certainly mm. not going to be their biggest account or even meet their minimum order quantities in the beginning. So um, really developing that relationship and finding the right partner uh, for manufacturing. And I'm still, you know, managing the point of contact there. So yeah, inventory, logistics, manufacturing, fulfillment, um, all of that. And then the fun, meaty stuff, which is my real house of partnerships, collaborations, marketing. I still write every email we send and every mm. <laughs> caption of every post. So a lot of time creating content and, and putting, representing us uh, out there in the world and just starting to hopefully build my first team. Wow. So cool. Uh, one thing you just mentioned was you know, you're writing every email, which is really, really powerful <laughs> uh, and also a lot of work. <laughs> um, uh, I think you 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 talked a little bit about your customer journey as sort of like um, as customers first entered into the Jiggy world, you know, they're coming in through social and through word of mouth and some other places. Um, how how you know, how do those very personal emails uh, start to build upon that first interaction and and does has it encourage repeat purchasing and yeah do you see like that how do you see building that community in the future um, as, and uh, especially given that you're gonna be expanding your team yeah it it definitely has I have actually been surprised at email, you know, I, at the skim, obviously it was the core of our business. Um, I think at first I was feeling people were maybe getting burned out on email or protective of their inboxes. That's certainly how I felt. So I kind of took the approach of, I don't need to, I don't need to send an email for the sake of it. Like I'm going to send an email when we have something to say, or, you know, something to share that I feel would actually be valuable for our community. And, you know, I'm just respect the inbox, I think is my, my overall uh, philosophy on email and to have still writing them. It is very personal when we do send them. So we send just, I send like, you know, kind of straight marketing ones and kind of similar to respecting the inbox. My philosophy with those is like, we both know why we're here. Like I'm, you know, we just launched a new thing. I would like for you to check it out or buy it. So it's very like kind of Mm. short, cheeky to the point, beautiful, photos, um, and, and pretty straightforward. And then the more storytelling side of things, 
Um, you know, we feature our artists and show them in their studios. And I think it's just a fun escape to see the process, especially if it's a piece that you're working on and just to know the story behind the art that you're doing. I also started a, it's actually our, also our about page. Um, but it's essentially like life lessons learned through puzzling. And it just, when I was doing puzzles every single night, it just occurred to me like, patience and delayed gratification and trial and error and like Mm. have a framework, but also like be flexible. You know, I was just like, I'm learning like real life philosophy from doing jigsaw puzzles. So Mm. I started a whole series of Mm. like life lessons (laughs) through puzzling. That's Um, so good. Yeah. So, so that's a fun one. Uh, Good response to that email. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's just, I think it still just has that, you know, X, kind of X factor because it's just so organic to, to me and, and my story and ultimately, you know, the brand I'm trying to build. Are you a find the corners first kind of puzzler? (laughs) Yes. Corners, edges first, group by (laughs) color. I got some sorting plates. Um, once I really kind of set up my, my work area with like a mat, I had just flattened an Amazon box and was doing it on the back of a box because right. I was living in a studio apartment also. I needed to be able to like move it around. Um, but you know, I got like a mat and yeah, sorting plates and good lighting to tell, you know, the really gradient color differences. <laughs> so yeah, now I'm all, I'm hooked up. You, you ain't you ain't nothing if you don't have like a real puzzle space. <laughs> like, yeah. Forget just doing it at your dining table nonsense. It's like we've got to go. We've got to go like hard on the on the real. Pu- that's I mean puzzle furniture. That might be the next. Uh, jiggy, Maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah. Next extension. I, kind of extending on the analogy since I'm the king of bad analogies. When what 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 are the finding the corners and edges first of sort of operating a digital business for you. Um, and, you know, mm. without, without trying to prompt you to make it an OmniSend commercial, because a certain <laughs> you to do that. But I'm curious, like, what, what are some of the, the pieces of the tech stack and selling online that, uh, you know, that are pivotal for you and Jiggy? Yeah, I mean, good question. Those first couple of steps were really like, who who is our customer? Who are we trying to reach? Where are they now? Rather than trying to, you know, go find them and pull them into our, you know, insert ourselves kind of unnaturally, like, where are they? What are they paying attention to? So I think it's like even more so in the future when we invest in it, like affiliate, um, things like that. But the first first things were those, you know, easy automations, welcome, some incentive around sign up, it can be free shipping or 10% off. Um, and getting some basic analytics did want to understand, you know, our, I think if anything, maybe because I do have such a narrative approach that some things on the site, you know, optimizers are like, get it to convert, like sell yeah. quicker, shop, 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 you know? I'm like, no, I want to tell her story. Like, hold on. Um, but, you know, experimenting with some some of the site and interactions and making sure that it was in fact uh, very shoppable. Um, and, and then social. And I really, Instagram, I was expecting to be big for just a straight customer you know, acquisition visibility, but I don't think I really counted on the fact that ultimately people, you know, um, head of partnerships at XYZ, the head buyer at some big national retail, like they're also just people on Instagram. So honestly, the first three months was social was great for, for customer acquisition, but also a lot of inbound about collaborations, wholesale, um, partnerships that, that ended up coming from that. Um, so that was an interesting thing. Every inbound inquiry we got, you know, essentially was from Instagram in the beginning. It's so visual. That makes so much sense. You know, you've mentioned 
partnerships so many times and collapse. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. What does what does that mean for you? Uh, looking ahead, a partnership or a collab does that just mean like with another artist or with another brand? What does that actually mean? Yeah, so a couple that we're doing this uh, fall that I'm really excited about. We're actually launching this one next week, so I don't know when this will go live, but hopefully uh, it'll be on our site then. So we are partnering with. Sophia Bush started an organization called I Am a Voter that's all around voter registration, uh, turnout, awareness, rights. And so we had the idea. We actually worked with her before she created one of those originals. So back to the COVID fundraising originals, uh, we had the our network of artists who were creating the ones that we auctioned. But I also tapped a few kind of friends of the brand, celebrities who we had uh, gifted product to before, had some relationship with to create one of their own. And the model there was basically a raffle, a donate to enter. And so Sophia Bush did one. Uh, So we reconnected about the upcoming election and put together a small group of three artists who um, represent different geographies around the country, different backgrounds, races, aesthetics and style of art. And they created an original piece for us around voting and what voting means to them. And those are going to be uh, three special edition puzzles that um, we are going to sell and 50% of the proceeds go to I Am A Voter. Um, So that's going to be September, October and deliver before the election. And then um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we have one of our very first puzzles and bestsellers to to date has been our boobs puzzle, which is by a Brooklyn-based illustrator. It's, I think, 48 representations of different boobs, shapes, sizes, skin colors, I think there are three with different mastectomy scars and just inclusive celebratory, um, really fun, fun to puzzle. And, uh, and so we're doing a partnership with some women's health advocates, breast cancer survivors, um, to, to fundraise there for, for breast cancer research fund. So that will be October and then we're in the holidays and we have our first, um, specifically holiday collection. We launched last year, but our debut was a little bit more evergreen. So we have our holiday collection and we doubled up. We Our past two collections have been six designs, but we doubled up for the holidays and 12 days of Christmas. And so we have 12 artists from eight different countries um, that uh, are super representative, different, different styles. And um, that will be launching for yeah, the holidays. And some of those are original pieces just for the puzzle, um, which was exciting. So a lot, a lot coming through the end of the year. Wow. So much of your strategy uh, really, really is, I, I hear it a lot. And then I, you know, so you, you, I'll hear a guest say, oh, oh we're, we're really dependent on organic uh, and earned media. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, you know, I'll get what equates to be tens of thousands of dollars of retargeting for the next 365 days on the website. Um, (laughs) uh, I find, (laughs) uh, and I hope I haven't just thrown you over the bus and backed over you. Um, (laughs) There's such an interesting thing that you like, everything you come back to keeps, keeps coming back to that point. And it's so interesting to me that you can be missional, right? You can, you can be a missional Mm -hmm. brand. You can, you can still, uh, you, you can be community driven. You can uh, you can do all of this uh, in such an interesting and unique vertical, uh, and that I just think it's so creative and it seems very authentic. Um, and I, I just appreciate yeah. you sharing the story here. If if you're thinking about, you know, you're 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 in year one. What does year five look like? Um, <laughs> and what 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 do you have to solve for? Uh, not to not to load you down with, you know, all the stress of what you'll have to figure out over the next five. What does the next five years look like? Yeah. 
Um, thank you. I, I mean, that's all true. And I do want to say, you know, we, I'm getting to the point now, I'm like, okay, I have 10 months of data. Like now's the time I have people that, that I'm going to be bringing on and digging into the numbers and all of that. And, and I have been preparing for some potential fundraising conversations. And so things like the CAC and lifetime value and, and all of that is, it is important. And those, those are things that I have now started looking at, but they did come second. And, uh, I think, you know, we were chatting briefly before, I think sometimes it feels like maybe a barrier to entry that like, I need to understand these numbers or bake them in out of the gate. And, um, and I think there's so many ways to, to go about it and, uh, kind of leading with, leading in a different way. And then, you know, ultimately using what you have and coming back to it and understanding those numbers when you need to, um, is definitely Mm. has been a more organic path for me. Um, five years. Yeah. I, I just, I'm really driven by both of the, the, the sides of the business that I talked about. So our customers and our artists. So on the customer side, continuing to, create beautiful products that they want. Right now, it's it's our classic kind of first collection puzzle that comes with the, the glue and the jar. Um, there are some different extensions, versions of that that I have in mind. Um, really building that habitual behavior as, as I started doing them, you know, as a habit, as my nightly unwind, we are going to be launching a subscription model. So puzzle of the month, uh, membership, and, um, there'll be some programming and community and, and stuff around that, that subscription membership. Um, and, you know, continuing to build this artist community, giving them opportunities to showcase their work, to monetize their work, um, and as much as we can, you know, support, highlight and, and uplift them. Um, there are some other products we have in, in the pipeline. I think owning that whole, um, the whole experience, as I mentioned of you do the puzzle, but then what's the, what's the next step right now? It's gluing, our tagline is puzzles worth framing. We don't make frames quite yet, but you know, I could definitely see, um, see having a frame pairing for each of our designs. Mm. Um, and, and then, uh, on the kind of partnerships collaboration, um, I think there's some really interesting ways to utilize puzzles in a, um, kind of, promotional or, uh, you know, fan way. I'll give you one example. We're talking to a, um, record label about, you know, what would it look like if we timed, uh, a puzzle release around an album release and turn the album cover art into a puzzle. And it would be, you know, part of the, the merch that, that fans could buy alongside this new album. And as they're listening to the nice. music, they're putting together this puzzle of the album cover, you know, things like that, just creative ways to really, um, integrate more in, in different experiences. Um, and it's just, bring some puzzle joy to the world. (laughs) Mm. I love this. Like the way as you're talking about expanding, just like for me, it strikes all the right chords. I I just like, in as you're talking, I'm just thinking about how incredible it is. If you go into something that you're passionate about, which you established a passion for puzzles, which is just Mm -hmm. so cool. If you, if you have a passion for something and you have the right mindset around what is compelling to people about the, those things? The tool set and the like, the ability to get out there and do what you have done as one person is just, it overwhelmed me for a second. Like what you've been able to yeah. accomplish by yourself is just, it's astounding. It's something that I don't feel like in the past you know, even in the recent past would have been um, accomplishable by a single person and hats off to you. And I think it's inspiration for, for all the solopreneurs, there are aspiring solopreneurs out there that, you know, that can look and say, oh, wow, she took, she took, you know, 
the tools that were out there and he was able to accomplish so much. Kaylin, thank you so much for, yeah. for all of your insights and everything you've brought to us today in this conversation. Um, really inspiring. And we're, we're, uh, we're, we hope to see more businesses come about like yours that can bring uh, something that's so uplifting and so um, calming to people um, come, come to market in the way that you have. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I'm excited to keep in touch with you both. Thank you so much to Kaylin for joining us on the show. And thank you for listening to season four of Step by Step. I can't believe this is our fourth season. And thank you, Omnison, for helping make this possible. And thank you for tuning in. I want to know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with this information? Are you going to file it away and then move on to the next thing? Or are you going to actually put it into action? If you're putting it into action and you're going to set up some automation, some marketing automation so you can do more in every channel, drop me a line. Tell me about it at hello at futurecommerce.fm. And I want you to get your automation story straight. Get your marketing working for you in every single channel and automate your way and do more with less. You can do it right now at omnisend.com slash future commerce. Get that story started right now. Don't wait. Go to omnisend.com slash future commerce and tell them Philip sent you. You know, we have three other seasons of Step by Step besides this one. If you haven't checked them out, I highly recommend it. If you want to understand what the difference is between customer experience and customer support, if you've ever wondered what the difference was between private equity and venture capital, if you've ever wondered how to build a modern tech stack for e-commerce, we have seasons dedicated to all three of those topics. You can get them at futurecommerce.fm slash step by step. That's right. Future Commerce dot fm slash step by step thank you so much for listening and as we always say on the future commerce podcast the future is what you make of it so let's build a future together that we can all be proud of <laughs>